quick revision video on pH titration curves. So the first thing I'm going to do is look at the key zones on the titration curve. So you can see I've got numbers 1 to 4 there. So we'll just go through each of those in turn. So zone 1, at the start of the titration, the pH increases very slightly. So in this case, we've got the acid in the um, conical flask and the alkali is being added from the burette. So pH increases very slightly because the acid's in great excess. So when you get to zone 2, the pH is increasing more quickly now. The acid's no longer in large excess, so each drop of base causes a sharp rise in pH. So zone 3 is the centre of this vertical section, and that's when the moles of the chemicals are chemically or stoichiometrically equivalent according to the mole ratio in the equation. So that's the centre of the vertical section, the equivalence point. Zone 4, so that's kind of the same as zone 1. The pH is increasing very slightly because the base is in great excess. So we'll just finish this slide with this. The key part, I would say, of the curve is the vertical section. So you can see that pink dotted line now. Where that hits the um, x-axis is telling you the volume of alkali in this case or the volume of the substance in the burette required for neutralization. And obviously if you were doing the titration the other way around, so your acid was in the burette and your alkali was in the conical flask, your curve would just mirror this one so it would go like that. So what we're going to do now is look at all the different acid-base combinations and explain the key parts. So this is a strong acid, strong base titration curve. So you can see it starts at a very, very low pH, strong acid, and it finishes at a high pH, strong alkali. And the key thing about this curve is that the pH at equivalence is 7. And the reason for that, if you think about a typical strong acid, strong base reaction, so HCl plus NaOH, the products are not acidic or basic. So they can't accept or lose protons. So if we look at strong acid weak base now, so you can see the pH at the start is very low, strong acid. The pH at the end of the titration isn't as high as before, so it's, what's that, about 8 or 9, so that's typically the pH of a weak base. The other thing to note is the centre of the vertical section is now below 7, so if we think about a typical reaction for strong acid weak base, so we've got HCl plus aqueous ammonia, so I'm representing that as ammonium hydroxide. The thing to think about is the ammonium ion in the salt is actually a weak acid because it can donate a proton. So it can donate a proton to the water in the solution and therefore it can act as a weak acid. So the pH at equivalence reflects that, and it's below 7. Weak acid, strong base now. So weak acid, because the pH is higher than um, 1 or 2, but lower than 7. And strong base, pH is finishing quite high. And the other thing to note is the pH at equivalence now is greater than 7. So if we bring in a typical weak acid, strong base reaction, so ethanoic acid and sodium hydroxide, what we need to think about now is the ethanoate ion is actually a weak base because that can accept a proton from the water and so it's slightly alkaline. And the final one we'll look at is weak acid, weak base. So you can see the starting pH is sort of around 5, the final pH is around 9. And the thing to note here is the pH at equivalence depends on the relative sizes of the dissociation constants of the weak acid or weak base. And you'd be pleased to know none of that is required for A-level. So I just thought I'd summarise that with a slide with all four of them together. So we'll look at buffer region now for weak acid strong base pH curve. So if we bring the equation back up, ethanoic acid and sodium hydroxide, making sodium ethanoate and water, the buffer region is that region I've highlighted there. So that's because before the ethanoic acid gets completely neutralized, 
you're going to have both of the key ingredients or reagents for a buffer present. So you've got a weak acid and the salt of a weak acid. Obviously, as soon as you have neutralized the weak acid, that's all gone. So you wouldn't have any of that left. You'd only have the salt ion. And there's the equation that represents the buffer. So the next thing we'll think about is when would it be um, at its best as a buffer? It's the center of that section there. So that's called half equivalence. And that's because at half neutralization, we've got equal concentrations of weak acid and salt. So you've got your maximum capacity of dealing with H plus ions and OH minus ions. Remember, for the buffer to work, it has to, if you add H plus ions, you need a store of um, ethanoic ions in this case to mop them up and send the equilibrium to the left. If you add OH minus ions, that's going to remove H plus. So you need your reservoir of weak acid to dissociate more and put the H plus back. So at half neutralization, you've got equal quantities of these. So we'll move on to indicators now. So indicators typically change color over approximately one or two pH units. They are one color in acid and another color in alkali. So when you're choosing an indicator, it needs to change color at the equivalence point of the titration. So basically its pH range needs to lie in the vertical section of the curve. So if we just have a quick look at one of the curves again, so typically one or two drops of the substance in the burette, the titrant, is going to cause this rapid pH change. So as long as the pH range of the indicator lies in this vertical section, it's going to be okay because it's going to catch that part of the um, titration. So we'll just finish with a couple of examples of indicators. Now you don't have to know any specific indicators, but I always use methyl orange and phenolphthalein. So we've got all the information there. Methyl orange is red at low pH, so in acid conditions. It's yellow at higher pH. So the range of the indicator is 3.1 to 4.4. So below here it's red, above here it's yellow. So it's kind of orange in the middle. Phenolphthalein, you can see it's two colors and its pH range is that. So if we add the pH ranges to the curves, so you can see methyl orange is going to be about there and phenolphthalein is going to be about there. So if we just look at which ones are going to be okay. So methyl orange is obviously okay for the first one, strong acid, strong base. You can see its pH range is in the vertical section. It's not okay for this one. It is okay for the next one, strong acid, weak base, but it's not okay for the last one. And phenolphthalein, you can see it's okay for the first two, but it's not okay for the others.